Dere Torah. Please, Jehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name and the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Jehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Amen. You can be seated. Come to the tables if you want to. <coughs> and uh, the class can be dismissed. Hallelujah. The children uh, can go if they want. And um, everyone else open up to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7 with a little uh, vacation for you all. Appreciate Sister Sharon, Sister uh, Gail ministering the word of the Lord. I, I know it was good. Hallelujah. Comparable teachers, and I praise the Lord that we have comparable teachers that can <coughs> teach while I'm gone. Also, um, Amen. Well, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. This is uh, part 30, so it's 30 weeks in, and we're almost finished. We have probably just a maybe a couple weeks left after today, maybe. Yeah, probably a couple weeks left. And so uh, this is really, <coughs> when we've been talking about 1 Peter, we've been talking about practical living. And 1 Peter has been trying to share with us how to have practical living for ourselves, how we are to live. Also, how we are to practically use the life that we have in the Kehillah. And also how to have some practical living when it comes to this world. So how we live our own selves, how we live within a community, and how we live within the world. And so this uh, subtitle, because the whole title or the understanding of this uh, couple verses, is how to clothe yourselves with humility. If we look at 1 Peter chapter 5, Verses 5 through 7, it says, Likewise, you who are less experienced, submit to leaders. Furthermore, all of you should clothe yourselves in humility toward one another because God opposes the arrogant, <coughs> but to the humble he gives grace. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the right time he may lift you up. And then verse 7, throw all of your anxieties upon him because he what cares about you and like i said we've been absent for just a couple weeks in israel and you've had some different teachers so let me just go back and connect this to the previous context a couple weeks ago and we find that peter is exhorting leaders correct he's exhorting leaders in that local messianic kahila because it's very important that we understand what needs to happen in this kahila he also gives exhortations that are directed <coughs> to the elders and that they have this leadership responsibility because you're just not a leader without responsibility. There's some ways you act, some things in, that you do and how you talk. And so he, he directs those things to those elders. And we understood that elders could not not only meant those within the Kehillah, but if you are in a position of authority, a husband, a father, a mother, you could also understand that and uh, let those responsibilities also be attached to you. He also reminded us that he is a leader. And that's very important because he privately walked with Yeshua closely during his earthly life. And because he did that, then we can take what he's saying as fair from the very mouth of Yeshua. He followed him. He walked with him. He saw him. He heard him. Right. He sat and let the dust of his feet be upon his dust. He sat with him. He, he prayed with him. And so he's not someone who has been twice, three times, four times removed. Do you know what I'm saying? He's not getting it from someone else. He's getting it right from the very walk of Yeshua. So he wants you to understand that so that you, this is uh, some power. There's some authority in what he's saying to you. He is also in a, u a unique position to reinforce <coughs> the, the very things that Yeshua taught and demonstrated. 
which means how Yeshua taught, then he's trying to implement them in his life, and he wants you also to implement them in your life. How Yeshua demonstrated it, he's also trying to live it, um, and then he's also trying to tell you how to live it, correct? So the point is this. In, in any area of your life, it is usually the immature that try to exhort people when they have never walked within their shoes, okay? Um, has anyone's ever been married when a single person tries to tell you how to, how to be married? If I were you, I would be this way. If I was a husband, if I was a wife. If, if you've never had children <clears throat> and then someone's trying, to, you're going to try to tell people who have children how to, to raise them, even though you can have some insight and even though you can have some understanding, there's one thing that's lacking, and that is practical application. Right? So that's why when you look at 1 Peter chapter 5, 5, he tells the people who are not leaders, those who are less experienced, to submit to the leaders. Because even though you might have some insight, some vision, some understanding, what you do not have is practical application. And how many know that there's a lot of things you said, when I get married, this is how I'm going to do it. And when I have children, this is how I'm going to do it. And how many know that goes out the window? Completely and totally out the window. So when someone comes and says, Pastor, you know, if I was a shepherd or if I, you know, it was in your shoes is what I would do. But here's the thing. You're not in my shoes. You have not been a shepherd with these people. You have not lived with them. You don't know what it is. And so you really, though you might have some insight, you cannot come as an authority uh, that you have some very powerful things uh, because you just don't have practical application. So it's the same in the kahila. What you learn in your walk, you share with others. Did you get that? What you learn in your walk. It's one thing to read it. It's another thing to memorize it. It's another thing to have practical application in it. Correct? I can give you every verse in the Bible. I, if you say I'm sad, I can go, give me five minutes, I'll go to the computer, to Google, and, and find every scripture that has to do with being sad. And then I'll, I'll Google again, get every verse that has to do with joy, and then try to tell you, don't be sad, be joyful. But it's not coming from a practical application. And so I'm to share with you and how we walk. And so that's the power of your witness. The power of your witness is that someone who has been married for a long time, been through a lot of things, would certainly have some wisdom in a marriage, correct? As opposed to someone who is still wet behind the ears and has had no experience, correct? So this is why Peter can exhort leaders because it's <coughs> he's been down the road. He's been with Yeshua in good times and bad times. He's been there when there's been healings. He's been there when, when he's been uh, rebuked or betrayed or chased out. I mean, they, they've been through everything. So he understands. John chapter 14, let's look at it real quick. In verses 22 through 28, it says, uh, Yehuda said to him, What has happened, Lord, that you are about to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Yeshua answered him, If someone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. That's a very important verse, but that's not what I'm <coughs> going to uh, focus on. Someone who doesn't love me doesn't keep my words, and the word you are hearing is not my own, but that of the Father who sent me. Very important, because if you do love him, then you'll follow his word. And if you don't follow his word, it means you don't love him. And those who follow the word are his own. Right? And you follow him because you hear him. Correct? And what you hear is not what Yeshua is saying, but what the Father is saying. So Yeshua has not come to change what the Father said. He just told you. He's only telling you what the Father has already said. And we know the Father changes not. Okay? That's a whole little mini-sermon right there. Now, verse 25 is what I want to focus on. He says, I have told you these things while I am still with you. He had basically about three years <coughs> to share with these apostles, to share with these disciples, to teach them, to impart them very powerful things. Okay? A very short time. And what he says is then, but the counselor, the Ruach HaKadosh, whom the Father will send in my name, will do what? Will teach you everything. Stop. What is everything? That is... He will remind you of everything I have said to you. It's very important. Does the Ruach remind us of what we read? Yes, you study and he reminds us what we read. So you can somewhat apply this to you, but this verse actually 
is <coughs> specifically to the 12. In that what he's saying is, I've spent these years with you. I have been your teacher, your mentor. Therefore, everything I taught you, the Ruach is going to come and remind you because guess what? You're going to write First and Second Peter. You're going to write, <coughs> the apostles are going to write Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's going to be some things that they're going to write down because the Ruach is going to remind them because it's going to be not only for them but for you, right? So it's specifically for the 12 that what they learned, because you know they didn't walk around with a great big parchment and a great big pen and writing down things. Hold on, let me write that. They had to really, by faith, uh, hold on to, the, to this verse that the Ruach would recall and bring back to memory so that what they're saying is not their own, right? So though we can apply it to our own lives, it really is specific to those 12 and the teachings that we have today. So he exhorts leaders, and he exhorts leaders to shepherd the flock of Yehoah, remembering that the flock belongs to him and not to the leaders. He exhorts leaders to shepherd willingly, not as a matter of duty, but according to the will of Yehoah. This is just still previous context. He is exhorting us not to shepherd the flock of Yehoah in order to gain riches, but to do it voluntarily as serving Yehoah. If the Kahila can afford <coughs> then hallelujah, amen. It is a responsibility that you do not muzzle the ox. It is a responsibility that you will take care of those who God has placed within your house. But that's not the motive of why I'm here. And the sad thing is, in today's uh, religious circles, religion is big money. You might not feel it here, but it, but it really is big money throughout the world. And you can go into any Christian bookstore and see that it's big money because why it's big money is that if I find the niche or a problem that people need, then I can come up with the solution. And when I come up with the solution, then you will come to me and pay for my wisdom in a book form or a conference form or a, <coughs> seminar, a seminar form, and it's big money, right? I'll charge you $45 to come and, and hear what I have to say, and you will go. And you'll stand in line and wait because you have a problem and I have the answer. So religion can be big money. We know that, okay? So it, it's about finding something that people need and then charge them for the answer. And we know that's not biblical, but we know that's a lot of things that are, that are happening in the, today's world is not biblical. He exhorts leaders to shepherd in such a way as to be an example to the people who make up that flock of Yehoah. He ends that previous paragraph by reminding all who are in leadership that their full reward in <coughs> serving the chief shepherd will be hearing those words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Correct? That's your reward. Whatever else you get is extra. But the reward is to hear his voice. Right? And now in the remainder of the chapter, Peter expands his exhortation to the entire Messianic community, which is why we read, and let's go back, 1 Peter chapter 5, 5, which is the next slide. Likewise, and likewise means he's talking about the leaders and what he's just exhorting the leaders. Likewise, you who are what? Less experienced, submit to leaders. Well, what constitutes you being less experienced? You're not a leader. Because if you were experienced, you would move to a, a leadership position. Remember, we talked about it, within the Kehillah. So you are less experienced, maybe less experienced in that position, less experienced as you might have as much uh, salvation experience as I do, but not behind a pulpit, not as a shepherd, right? So that's what he's talking about. So that word likewise <coughs> is actually the first word of the sentence in the Greek, which is why I use this in the complete Jewish Bible, because in other translations it won't be the first word, but in really in the uh, original Greek, it is the first word, okay? And what that, the importance of that is, is that it links this paragraph with Peter's former exhortations. You have leaders, you have elders, so you who are less experienced, submit to them. And then he says, further, all of you, and all of you would mean what? Leaders and less experienced. All of you, involves all of you. Uh, you should clothe yourselves in humility toward one another. And we'll start to understand what that means. So this connection to the previous paragraph is very obvious 
even as the elders slash leaders are to shepherd the flock of Yehoah by humbly serving him, <coughs> the younger men are likewise to demonstrate their humble spirit by submitting to their leaders. So I am to humbly submit myself to him, and as those who are less experienced should humbly submit yourselves to those who God has put within <coughs> the fivefold ministry, those who are in charge of you. So there's a lot of humility going on, right? There's a lot of humility going on because what stops us from being humble? Pride. Well, I'm not going to humble myself. I'm not going to. But that's not what the scripture says, right? So to submit to leaders doesn't mean you agree with them all the time. This is where in the contemporary Christianity we get, we get confused because um, those behind the pulpit want you to understand that I am right all the time you are wrong. And what you need to do is learn to listen to what I'm saying. And maybe you haven't been in those circles, but if you were in contemporary Christianity and you said to the pastor, I, I disagree with you, uh, nine chances out of ten, you're shut down. Because you don't disagree with the man of God, right? But in this understanding of Hebraic understanding, what we find is to submit to leaders doesn't mean that you agree with them all the time. You can disagree, but you have to learn to disagree respectfully. Okay, And in fact, in Hebraic understanding, to have a dialogue of disagreement is actually a way we both learn. Which is why on a Wednesday night, I don't, I don't shut you down. I don't really give you time to ask questions on a Saturday because it, you know, sometimes you might be here forever. It's a different type of service. But this is a, a service that you can raise your hand and say, I don't get that, I don't understand that. And you won't be flogged or stoned. Right. And I'll try to explain my side, but it, I'm not explaining my side to get you to change your mind. I'm explaining my side so you can be more clear of what I am trying to relate to. But if you walk out in disagreement, it's not it's not the end of the world. Hello. And we haven't mastered that yet. Because one has to turn the other. And if we don't turn the other, then we just, I just can't, well, if you, if, uh, if you don't agree with me, then I, I can't worship with you. Well, that's a, a dumb statement, right? Because even as husbands and wives, we don't always agree on everything. You might pretend, but you don't. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? You might smell, oh, yeah, I get it. But in your brain, you're like, I don't get this at all. So, and your children certainly don't agree with everything that you do and how you discipline, correct? And they learn to submit. Right. And they don't they don't revolt. They don't call a taxi, Uber or uh, Lyft to get out of the way. You know, even though you give them the number, um, you learn to live together and move on. And then when they go out on their own, they might not raise the children the same way you raise. Correct. And that's not a deal breaker either. You might scratch your head. You might wait for an opportunity to say, well, I told you. But. So. We don't have to always agree. Now, I'm not saying that you look for places where you can disagree. But they're not deal breakers. However, if they have authority, your first thought should be maybe they know something I don't know. So if I'm sharing something with you and you disagree, your first thought really should be. Have I studied it like he studied it? Do I know what he knows? And then you might want to just pay attention for a while. See, there's three things we should understand, and I want you to get these three things. They're not up here, so you're going to have to write them down or wait for the Ruach to bring them to your remembrance after you get home. But there are three things we should remember, and these are very important. The first thing is you need to get yourself a teacher, and I pray that I am your teacher because I don't know why you would be here if I'm not considered one of your teachers, all right? But you need a teacher. And the reason why that's important is because people like to stay home and be their own teacher. And let me tell you, if, if I went through high school being my own teacher, I would have had a 4.0. <coughs> but because I had a teacher, I didn't. And because I didn't have a teacher, because I had a teacher, sometimes I passed and sometimes I didn't, right? But we would make it very easy on ourselves. So we're not a good teacher to us, right? So get yourself a teacher. Number two... Give yourself to study or apply yourself to study. Study to show yourself approved, correct? 
You don't come here just to eat from me without studying. The power of me giving you this word is that you've studied and it has a agreement with you. All right. I should give you some revelation, some wisdom from time to time. But really what I'm saying is basically what you should have already read. And there should be. Oh, that's right. An, an, an agreement and building of faith. Correct. If everything I say to you is always going to be something new and shocking, it just means you haven't been studying. So get yourself a teacher. Number two, get, give yourself to study. And number three, very important, just as important, maybe even more important than the first two. <clears throat> there is nothing more important than silence. Silence. Listen, many don't learn because they don't listen. Because when they are hearing the teacher, they are already starting to formulate what they disagree with. Sometimes in my sermons, I start with a basis which could be sketchy or something you might disagree with. But if you would just keep your mind and heart open and let me follow through, you might come to an agreement later on. But as soon as we hear something that we might not quite get nor agree with, we already are formulating and shutting down and getting ready and want to, we are arming ourselves. We are ready to go. And what happens is then you've missed it, and then when everyone else gets it and you say, but I don't agree with you, you actually do agree with me, but you did not allow yourself to hear <coughs> and hear that response. So. Uh, again, that's in every area. I mean, you know, your, t your uh, children are trying to explain something to you. You shut them down because you don't want to hear it. You heard one thing, right? Husbands and wives, we hear one thing. We start to disagree, and we just want to jump in there. Well, let me tell you this, and, but hold on. Let me finish. You don't need to finish. I know where you're going. And so we have this great big uh, you know, disruption. And so get yourself a teacher. <coughs> give yourself to study, and be quiet. Does it mean you shouldn't ask questions? No. But you shouldn't be so quick to ask a question because sometimes the answer is there before you ask it, right? So we have to learn to listen. Learn to listen. To learn is to listen, which is part of submitting. Did you hear what I just said? To learn is to listen, which is part of Submitting. You'll not be able to submit if you have not heard. Want you to go clean your room? I already disagree with about cleaning my room. Therefore, I've already shut down to give you the and formulate the argument of why I don't have to do it at this moment. And I miss everything that has to do with that. And therefore, I go in and I don't do it the way you told me to do, which means I haven't submitted to you. And the reason why I didn't submit to you is because I didn't listen. So what does Peter say? He says, younger men... Right? Younger men learn to submit. What is he saying? Younger men, get yourself a teacher. Younger men, uh, apply some study to your life. And younger men, shut your mouth. So that you can understand something. Okay? The comparative form of the noun <coughs> of, of younger men, which means new or recent or fresh, which just means that not only can they be younger in age, it can also mean younger in faith. Even though it, the comparative form actually means younger in age, we can also cross it over younger in faith. Because you can be older and not have the wisdom or the practical application you know what I'm saying? You can come in here and be 90 years old and I can uh, ordain you, and it doesn't mean that you have practical application like I have that started at 20. So you can say, well, you know, I'm, I've had practical uh, application of life. You certainly have, and you've had more life than I have, but you haven't had this life. So we have to learn to submit to authority. And the question would be, why is it so difficult for us to submit to authority? Because let's just face it, it is difficult. <coughs> especially when you hear the word no or ask to go in a different direction than you want to go. If everyone tells you to go in the direction you want to go, it's easy, right? I want you all at a party tonight. Okay. I want you all cleaning up the house. Oh. It's easy when you want to do something. So why is it so difficult? Anyone have a suggestion? Why is it so difficult to submit?
okay, he gave us dominion. But, and that was good dominion, but then something happened, correct? And we messed that up, and so now within that dominion that was holy, it, now something else has entered in, and now sinful nature has taken over. So now it's not dominion because of God, it's dominion because we want. So it's contrary to our sinful nature, which means you're going to have to work at being submitted to have submission. Just because he says, wives, submit yourself to your husband, <coughs> it's not in you. In the sinful nature. It's in you if you're in him. Because then he starts ruling in you. And that's natural. Right? But when you're working through sinful nature, it's very, it's very difficult. Because sinful nature doesn't want us to do that. Uh, a, a quote from Calvin says, nothing is more adverse to the disposition of man than subjection. So what does submission mean? Submission means becoming a servant. Submission means putting your desires in second place. <clears throat> and most of us live with our desires in first place. You know why this place hasn't filled up tonight? People has desires in second place. <clears throat> God's desires in second place. And their desire is first place. Some other, other reasons, you know, work or whatever. But you know, I'm just saying, some are not here for the simple reason is their desires are first place and not, and not second place. And to submit means <coughs> putting your desires in second place. We have to understand the motivation of our life. What motivates you? See, some of the things uh, that motivate us usually is uh, I'm going to give my tithing. I'm going to give my offering. And what motivates us? <coughs> Sometimes fear. Sometimes open up the windows of heaven, pour out blessings, stop the devourer, cause reward. Correct? So, you know, what causes us to come to know him? Because we're fearful we don't want to go to hell. None of us want to go to hell. We've seen it. We don't want to go there. I mean, if you're still debating whether you want to go there, you haven't had a really good, a good picture. <laughs> I don't want to go there. Right? So sometimes my motivation is because of reward or because of consequence, because of actually even a, a, you know, a dead end. If I do this, this is what's going to happen. I don't want to have to happen, so I'm going to do this. That's some of our motivation. Why are you here? I don't want pastor to say anything to me. I don't want to, uh, you know, I'm supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to forsake. <coughs> all there are different reasons. Or my sister's going to be there. My brother's going to be there. I need to go there or whatever. All those are motivations. Or are you motivated by love? And if you're motivated by love, that's true submission because to submit because you get something back is actually kind of a, a different type of submission as opposed to submitting whether you get anything back, you're submitting just because you love whether you get anything back. So you give, and if, there is not an open heaven, if there is not a return of 30-fold, uh, 60-fold, uh, <coughs> 100-fold, that's not the motivating factor, right? The motivating factor is I love him. So therefore, I will be where he tells me to be. I will worship the way he wants me to worship. I will do what he wants me to do, not because I gain anything. If I gain anything, then, oh, glory to hallelujah, Baruch Hashem. But if I don't, that's not why I'm doing it, Right? Someone's having a fight, your, your uh, children having a fight, you say, go apologize, they apologize. Why are they apologizing? So they don't get whipped, timed out, or, right? You don't get any candy unless you apologize. I'm sorry. You mo the motivation of saying I'm sorry was because they're going to get a reward or a lack of reward. What you would love for them to do is, I recognize that I just hurt my sibling, and I want to go home and say I am sorry. Mom and dad has not even told me to do it. I am sorry because I love you. And then mom and dad, we would faint. And they'd have to call the ambulance because they thought we died. And that would be wonderful. That's how we all are motivated. Why are you here? Not because you're supposed to be, not because I'm expected to be, but because you love him. And you do <coughs> things because you love him. So why does Peter then speak specifically to the younger men? Because remember, first part of verse 5 <coughs> is likewise, you younger men. Because youth may often think that the elders are out of touch with the, with the current times. 
You know what I'm saying? Oh, mom, your old dad, that's in your generation. That's what they did. It's a new generation. We think differently. And in reality, no, you don't because you have the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, just like all of us. It's no different. Okay? Um, also, youth often excel in physical energy. And so when they do that, they think that they are bigger, better, better, right? <coughs> because you're slower, <laughs> um, you don't have quite that. But they do lack experience and lack learning, which leaves them kind of short on wisdom. They got physical energy, but they're short on wisdom, which is why they'll pick up all those things and go up there, but by the time they put everything up there, you're like, why did you do that? Now you have to take it all down. It might take you a little longer to get things up there, but you know what you're going to do when you get there, right? Youth are sometimes attracted to positions of authority, but wisdom knows that true authority means being a servant. So he's really kind of looking at young men and saying, listen, <coughs> you are attracted to authority, but you need to learn to submit because you're going to have to have some wisdom in that understanding, and that's where wisdom is going to come. So again, let's look at verse 5 again. Likewise, you who are less experienced, young men, submit to leaders, and what's the next part say? Further... All of you should clothe yourselves in humility toward one another. So let's look at that for a moment. That middle part of that verse, if you write in your Bible, I want you to underline it and say, <coughs> this is essential for true community. It is essential for true community. You know, even the scripture says, if you don't work, you don't what? Eat. And why that is related to that is because when you clothe yourself with humility, it means you are putting yourself in a, per, in a place where you are serving people. This place is not about people serving you. It's about people serving each other. It's not about you benefiting from other, everyone else's giving and everyone else's work. It means that you roll up your sleeves also to work and you also dig in your pocket and you also give and you also, when it's time to clean up, you are also cleaning up. No one's cleaning up after you, even though that does happen. <coughs> no one is uh, covering you, even though that does happen. It means that unless you work, you do not eat. And unless you understand the power of community, then sitting there and allowing everyone else to do everything for you, you don't understand community. Because you have to also understand when you say to your children, go clean your room, I'm not, <coughs> you're, I'm not your servant and your slave. You're going to have to do something around this house. You might say it a different way. You're going to have to earn your keep, right? Or, you know, these are not only my dishes, that's not just my house, it's your house too, so <clears throat> it's the same thing. Philippians 2 verses 3 and 4 talks about it this way, do nothing out of rivalry or vanity, but in what? Humility. Regard, and here's what he says, regard each other as what? Better than yourselves. Let that soak in for a moment, because usually we think ourselves better than anyone else which is why we want to be served. But listen, if, if the electric is due, then you're not any better than anyone else. Everyone has to chip in. You're not better than anyone else, right? <coughs> if it's time to clean up uh, from fellowship, you're not better than anyone else. Get up. Pick up, a t pick up something. Hello? Look out for each other's interest and not just for your own. Not just for your own. Our human body shows us that. The human body cannot function unless each part is willing to work together with the other parts. If you got up this morning and your feet said, your legs said, I'm not going anywhere, <coughs> then it really has messed up your whole day, right? Because the human body must function together, right? I mean, we would like it for the, the, the hand to say, open your mouth, and the mouth say, no. But they have to work together, right? So God has given us the example every single day of our lives that you cannot function outside yourself. The legs have to work with the, 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 <coughs> the body, the, 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 the arms, the head, the eye. All of it has to work together. There's not one that is better than the other, right? 
even an eyelash has a purpose. Correct? So you, one cannot say to another, I'm better than you, because without each one, they cannot function. And that's what he's saying in Philippians. He's say, and that's what he's talking about, uh, uh, the essential for a true community. That's why he's saying, clothe yourself in humility. You're not bigger and better than anyone else. So if everyone else is working, you work. If everyone else is giving, you give. If everyone else is doing something, you do it. Don't sit there like you're the king and queen. You can't kahila unless you are willing to serve one another. And so Paul uses the metaphor of the human body to describe the function of the messianic assembly. <coughs> Clothe yourself with humility. If you won't work, you won't, you won't eat. You are part of a community. You're a part of a body. You have to function as a body. And if the body is going in a certain direction, if every, every part of your body is going left and the one right leg wants to go right, it ain't hap there's something not working. And if that happens, you know that something's wrong. You're going to call a doctor because your body's out of function. There's something sick with your body. You need, you need a checkup to see why that is going on. So he says, clothe yourselves with humility. So what is the meaning of that metaphor? Clothe yourselves with humility. That word clothe, it's very important because he uses specific words for specific reasons, correct? So that Greek word, I can't even say it. <coughs> we looked it up and tried to say it, but I can't remember. Uh, you can take a good stab at it if you want. Someone yell it out what you think it is. <laughs> in kumbu ma I think it's may though. I think when we looked up it was may. So anyway, the Greek word, that word, which has to do with clothing, found only here in the apostolic scriptures. Now remember, when we find a word that's only used once in the apostolic scriptures, that means it's very <coughs> important because they had other words to use, but they zoned in on that word, which makes it odd, but pertinent, correct? And it says, or what that word means then in the Greek, to put on clothing, clothing that is bound by a sash or belt. Now that doesn't mean that's to make you look pretty. You know, the word of God says, gird up your loins. What does gird up your loins mean? Right, pull your robe up. And why are you pulling your robe up? So you can work. It's the whole thing about working. So this whole understanding about <coughs> clothe yourself with humility is, Take your robe, pull it up, grab that sash or that belt, because guess what? It is time to work. <coughs> Come in your middle, gird yourself, get ready to serve. It's not about you. You're not sitting there not girded up. You're, uh, you know, because not to be girded up means that you're in relaxation. There's, there's no movement. You're being waited on, and it's not, we're not here. Listen, there, there's going to be uh, an eternity, if you want to say, to run around and however you think your eternity will be. But right now, there is work to be done. <coughs> there is a fight to, to, to be in. There is a race to be run. Correct? And so he's telling us, not only in Peter, but he's also telling us in Philippians, he's telling us to gird yourself up with a sash or a belt, which means ready to work. It is used particularly of a slave or a worker <coughs> tying on an apron or an outer cloak for work. So he says to the all of you, he didn't say just to the younger, he said to all of you, clothe yourself in humility, which means what? The true essence of a community <coughs> is that you're serving one another and no one's being served. Just serve me, right? It means always be ready to serve one another within the body of the Messiah. No questions asked, <coughs> and even if there is no reward, where will your reward come from? Him. So such service or work involves genuine love, which includes tough love, right? It, it means speaking the truth in love. It means um, bearing each other's burdens. It means rejoicing with those who rejoice. And it means weeping with those who, who weep. You're putting in, right, the time and <coughs> the substance of your life 
you are ready to serve one another. You're clothed in humility. And everything that's going on in your life is going on in my life. And we're all working together. We're all functioning together as a body. And we're all working because we all want to eat. God then in that verse <coughs> says he is opposed to the proud. But gives what? Grace to the humble. But to the humble he gives grace. <coughs> so those who are less experienced, who are not leaders, learn to submit yourself to those leaders. All of us then should clothe ourselves in humility, which means get ready to work for one another because that's the true essence of a community, right? How do I know you're part of my family? <coughs> I mean, really part of my family? Because when you come to eat, you're part of the cleanup, you're part of the fix-up, you're part of everything. When we get together, everyone cleans up. That's how you know you're part of the family. If you're not part of the family, what are you doing? Sitting there. And if you're just a visitor, I get it. But if you're part of the family, I might look at you and say, hello, you want to do something for me? At Habdallah or <coughs> Habdallah, however you want to say it, the children, after it's all over, children help, and the children go and help put dishes away. Why? Because that's the true essence of a family. Whether you're young or whether you're old, and we need to be teaching our children, Correct? Because you don't want them to be waited on all the time, and then when they get older, guess what they want? They want you to wait on them, and they're shocked when you want them to do something. Well, what? So God is opposed to the proud. <coughs> and I want you to understand that word opposed, okay? Our primary motivation must be first and foremost to live in obedience to Yehovah. That should be your primary and foremost motivation. I want to be obedient to him because I what? I love him. So when we look at 1 Peter chapter 5, and it, and it talks about <coughs> he opposes um, those who are pri prideful and gives grace to the humble, he's actually quoting from Proverbs 3.34, which in the subjugent says, the scornful he scorns, but gives grace to the humble. I mean, in the, <coughs> in the Hebrew text, it says, the scornful he scorns, but gives grace to the humble. And they switched it in the subjugent in the Greek because... I think they just thought it was too harsh to think that God would scorn. So he's more opposing. <coughs> but that's stronger. He scorns those who are scornful, right? So that Hebrew word being translated as though he scoffs at the scoffers, yet he gives grace to those afflicted. So both Greek and Hebrew and that understanding actually means that Yehovah actively <coughs> opposes or resist the person who sits in pride or arrogance. So my question is, would you want God to resist you? You saw the one uh, slide when we were at Magdala and the wind was blowing off the Sea of Galilee. The wind was blowing our hair and our clothing were going everywhere. And when you walked, you were going against the wind. Why would any of us want to walk against God? To walk against God takes a lot of energy, and you're not going to get anywhere. Right? So what he's saying to you is that <coughs> if you're prideful, he pushes against you. He resists you. So you come to him, he'll resist you. <coughs> he'll blow against you. He will oppose you because he opposes the proud, but gives what? Grace to the humble. So when you come... Humbly, he'll receive you. When you come privately, he resists you. So connect that to servanthood. If you're in a church and, the, and you have not established yourself as true part of the community and you are always allowing someone else to do, you're not a part, you're not <coughs> working, you're not engaging, you're not serving, you have not girded up your loins, you're actually being resisted. Because that resisting is part of the true essence of the kahila, because he's not talking about, I just resist you, God. <coughs> the result of resisting him means that you are resisting each other. So, in contrast to the resistance, Yehovah gives his grace to the humble. I want, I need more grace. I need more grace. Every day of my life, I need more grace, right? I don't need anyone. I have enough people against me, I don't need him. And if he is for you, then what? Who can be against you? We like that verse, but then put it this way. If he's against you, <laughs> who's going to help you? Nobody. You know what I'm saying? 
<laughs> you can't say, uh, you might as well wrap it up. All right, so let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, the two last verses. The, the first verse of, the <coughs> of uh, these two verses, 6, Therefore, since you understand what I just said in verse 5, therefore, do what? Humble yourself. If you get it, then humble yourself. Gird up your loins, become part of the true assembly, understand what it means to work and serve and, <coughs> and, and, and give to one another, right? Therefore, humble yourselves under the what? Under the mighty hand of Yehovah. You're not doing it for me. You're doing it for him. Well, if I serve that, you're not. Ser though you are serving each other, you're actually serving him. So when you refu refuse to serve one another, you are refusing to serve him. So that, and why does he want you to do it? So that at the what? Right time, he may what? Lift you up. What's the right time? Whenever he wants to. When do we think the right time is? As soon as I do it. <coughs> so I want to give it, and then I'm looking for a check in the mail. I want to extend forgiveness, but then I'm looking for some great things to come to my life. And if it doesn't happen within the week, I'm all mad. Well, that didn't work. That didn't work. You don't know how many times people I tried to I, I've tried to give and I gave and nothing happened. Well, how many times you got? I gave three times. Wow. You better slow down. <laughs> You're probably broke now. God's taking all your money. And whose timing? His timing. He will do what? Lift you up. That means you could serve me, and you'll never hear thank you from me, even though you should, and even though there should be an expression of appreciation just because that's how we are. We're civil people, right? <coughs> We've been raised right, hopefully. But if you don't get it, it doesn't matter because you're not serving them to receive that. You're serving him, and he may lift you up when? In his timing. And on your deathbed, you're thinking, I still didn't get it. You'll get it. Because when you see him face to face, you hear those words that say what? Well done, and that will be the, worth it everything, correct? So in verse 6, Jehovah is the one who brings good out of service to one another. He's the one that does that. And it is when we serve one another out of a primary desire to serve Jehovah, and we do it in accordance with his instructions, that we can rest assured that he will accomplish what we on our own cannot. We trust him. <coughs> he will turn those things that were meant for bad for good, and you cannot even imagine what he has for you. Correct? If our primary purpose is to serve Yehovah first and foremost, and out of this desire we learn to serve one another, then ultimately the <coughs> accommodation we seek is from Yehovah, not from man. And if all you wanted is from man, you might get it, but that's a treasure on this earth, and it will quickly fade away. I'd rather hold off and get everything I get up there. Right? When? At the proper time. And what's the proper time mean? As Jehovah has planned it. Are your steps ordered by him or not? Yes or no? Yes, then that means the lifting up of you is at his timing when he desires it, when he wants it, and you just have to learn to trust him. And when you get that, <coughs> then he tells you verse 7. And what is that? Throw all your anxieties upon him because he cares about you. Now, don't just think that's out of play because that goes along with your humility. And his timing and him lifting you up. Because if you're serving and you're not getting the recognition and you're not getting the thank you, it can be quite frustrating and <coughs> can cause quite amount of anxiety. Maybe I've been preaching for 30 years here and I don't think I've gotten the right appreciation. Well, you have a lot of anxiety, right? And you start carrying those cares. So what he's saying is, if you get this and do this, then you're able to, to throw all your anxieties upon him because who cares for you? He does. You've been worried about everyone else caring for you. So that word throw or that word cast all your anxiety. 
I used last night in the illustration that if you were um, going outside to find a rope, just say uh, <coughs> Benny wanted Bonnie to serve him, and he knew there was a rope in the truck, so he said, Honey Bunny, Boo Boo, would you go out and get my rope out of the truck? So she goes out and puts her hand in the back of the truck to get the rope. She feels the rope, and she pulls it up, and when she pulls it up, she realizes it's moving. It's called a snake. What does she do with that snake? She probably won't drop it. She'll probably go, <laughs> right? Then when she comes into Benny's, there might be something going on. But if you picked up something, you're going to throw it. That's what he's talking about. Cast it away. Throw it. <coughs> Don't put it back in your pocket. Don't put it somewhere where you can pick it up again. Get rid of it. Throw the anxiety away. He cares for you. Well, the only thing about fishing is that you're going to reel it back in. You can't reel it back in if you're fishing. So don't, don't think about it as fishing <coughs> because there, I get rid of it. And then I slowly bring it back in. Then I throw it out again. No one, once they threw a snake, is going to go look for the snake to pick it back up again. Right? So what he's saying is throw all your uh, anxieties upon him because he cares about you. What that means is that you're living the life of an obedient servant to Yehovah. And thus, you're serving each other, and it's not a guarantee, however, that there will be a life <coughs> that will be a bed of roses. Oh, I'll be blessed going in, blessed going out. How many know you can be blessed going in, blessed going out, but also hit a wall? Also trip over a hole, right? Just because you're blessed doesn't mean <coughs> that you're not going to experience hail, wind, rain, flood. Right? So you can't, I'm going to live a life of obedience and everything's going to be wonderful. <laughs> no. Because by the time you live a life of obedience, you will have fought so many things to live that life. Right? So serving each other requires growing in faith because you will inevitably come to the end of yourself. Requiring you to trust him for things that you have not yet experience and what does that mean it means that you are able to trust him for that which is beyond us and that which is yet <coughs> future I don't know what's happening tomorrow so I trust him right it means you're able to give him your cares or anxiety you're trusting him fully with the outcome I trust him it's a hard place isn't it because sometimes we say we do but at the same time we're trying to figure out what's going on what's the outcome going to be and if you truly have cast that care and anxiety, then it, you don't have to worry about the outcome. You know the outcome will be what he wants it to be. That you have to grow in your understanding that Yehovah in truth has your lives in his hands, that he genuinely cares for you. And as we grow in our understanding of this great truth, we affirm it every day of our lives. Every day of our lives. Don't think you're going to put humility on tonight, and then you're going to have to redo it again in about a month. I guarantee you put it on the night, you'll have to redo it again tomorrow morning. Maybe even the middle of the night. It just depends, right? It's something that you clothe yourself, you girt yourself up every single time. So let me summarize this. We talked about tonight humility. It's the main topic, right? And humility <coughs> is the willingness to allow others to think less of yourself than who you are. And that's the primary theme, actually, of the first part of chapter 5. If you remember Yeshua, when Yeshua stood before the crowd, he stood before the religious people, he stood before the Romans, <coughs> what was said about him? That he blasphemed, that he was a liar, that he did all these things, correct? Correct. Was he? No. Did he rebuke them, have a rebuttal? No. Did his apostles know that they were lies? Yes. Did everyone else know that they were lies? No. So that means there were people there, fake media, that were saying lies about him, and he chose not to rebuttal it. 
He chose not to counter it. <clears throat> he chose to let them believe that's what he did. By trusting Yehovah. Now there are times that you might stand up and say, that is not true, that it, you know what I'm saying? And then there's times you have to be what? Quiet and silent. Because what did he know? He knew, first of all, <coughs> if he said this was not true and he truly had a trial, then actually he would not succumb and submit himself to his death, which would then not bring us freedom. Correct? And at that moment, he knew that was the will of God, so it was to be quiet. So we have to trust him. And sometimes you do speak, and sometimes you do not speak, correct? Sometimes you have to realize it's not really about my reputation. If that's what you think, then that's what you think. And, any, and, and really, <coughs> probably, if he just argued about that's not what he was, they wouldn't have believed him anyway. Because when people have a thinking process, they'll believe what they want to believe, right? Right? So sometimes you just learn to not say anything and trust Jehovah. So humbly serving means doing it for Jehovah's glory, not for applause of people or even for their appreciation. Humbling serving each other is to walk in the footsteps of our Messiah, Yeshua. And in order to serve one another in this way, we have to first understand and commit ourselves to the truth. And the truth is <clears throat> the serving of one another is a result of serving Yehovah. It's the same principle. <coughs> principle. You say you love me and hate your brother, you're a liar. You say you serve me and won't serve one another, you're a liar. You say you receive my forgiveness, but you will not give forgiveness, then you didn't get it. Right? You're not understanding the principle. So that's what we have to understand. When I refrain from serving you, it means I'm refraining from serving him. So humbly <coughs> serving each other requires growing in our faith in Yehovah because we're not natural servants. Because pride sometimes stops us. I'm not saying that you don't, some are more servant, you know, <coughs> led than others. Some of you have to really work at it. Some of you it's easier to flow and it really comes from environment, how you were brought up. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, you've seen my mother. She walked around, and so, you know, sometimes people say, well, sit down. It's just in me. I, I, I have to get up and take your plate. I have to get up and do something. <coughs> you know, I don't mind being served, but it takes great effort. Do you know what I'm saying? Some takes great effort to get up. Hello, do you see us? What? <coughs> and it's not that really... They're making a brain. I mean, really, it's just something that's not in them. So we have to make these conscious decisions. So what we should say is when we uh, arrived, uh, are your lo loins girded today? Because it's time to serve. It's time to serve. <coughs> Serving each other will sometimes be difficult <coughs> because it's against our sinful nature. And we have to learn to persevere. We have to keep our focus on serving Yehovah. And we have to rely upon him to supply the strength that we need. <coughs> Even if you don't feel like it, you got to do it. Right? All of us who've had children know that's true. Sometimes you don't feel like messing with them. Hello? Dinner time? Frosted flakes and some milk is really good. I mean, read the back. It has nutritional value. <laughs> it's like having an egg. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just sometimes you're like, oh, can't you dress yourself? <coughs> you can't wait till they get a little bit older. Hallelujah. They finally go to the bathroom by themselves. I can sit on the couch. don't have to go. They can finally get water by themselves. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's not that you don't want to serve them, but sometimes you get exhausted, right? So you have to rely upon the supply of strength that comes from him. Same thing with us as adults. <coughs> sometimes you come, you don't feel like doing it. You have to what? Gird it up. Gird it up, push through, strength, come. So knowing and affirming that Jehovah cares for us means that we can cast our anxieties upon him and knowing that he is able and willing to carry that which weighs us down. <coughs> Quit being weighed down. So let me give you this last verse. Psalms 23.1, what does it say? 
Jehovah is my shepherd, Yeshua is my shepherd, I shall not want. I lack nothing. <coughs> you know, uh, the Jewish people, they rise every morning, they do morning prayers, and part of that morning prayer is, Baruch Atah Adonai, Melech HaLolam, Sheyasa Li Ko Zaki, which means, <coughs> blessed are you, Adonai our God, King of the universe, who has provided me with all my needs. They didn't pray it at the end. They prayed in the morning. <coughs> Sometimes we wait to the end and see if it happened. And then we tie on those things where the, our needs are still. And Lord, can you meet this need? And will you do this? They stand in proclamation in the morning. You have met all my needs today, this morning. <coughs> That's trust. That's faith. And when you believe that, what will you do? You'll gird your loins, ready to serve, because your needs are what? Are met. Amen? Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who has provided me with all my needs. Write that down. Speak it in the morning. <coughs> Tomorrow morning, get up. Try it in Hebrew. Even if you don't mess it, even if you mess it up, he gets it. He's not like, what'd you say? <laughs> he might chuckle, but he'll get it. <coughs> he'll say, look at that little sweetheart trying to speak my language. Then say it in English. Let that be your proclamation every morning. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> you have provided me with all my needs. That means at the end of the day, whatever you got is what you needed. And anything else was a want. And if it wasn't given to you as a want, then you didn't need it. Right? <coughs> so, Lord, thank you for blessing all and giving me all my needs. At the end of the day, guess what? Before I go to bed, you, everything I needed, you gave it to me. Because I asked you, and therefore you did it. So don't write your wants down. And you don't even have to write your needs down. Because he knows what you need before you need it. So you're telling him thank you for meeting those needs. I'm sure sometimes when we're praying, he says, oh, I wish they would learn <coughs> to be quiet. And to listen. They chose a teacher. I am the chief shepherd. If they would just study to show themselves approved, know my word, <coughs> my ruach will bring to remembrance. And if they will then just learn to be quiet, I might be able to do something. Because being quiet means you're learned how to be a servant. Whew. Amen? Any questions? Everyone's I'm quiet. I, I can't say anything. You told me to be quiet. <laughs> <coughs> Hallelujah. Let's stand before you. <laughs> He's good. Pride and arrogance. Arrogance to me sounds a little stronger, but it's the same word. <coughs> Hallelujah. You are the most high. You are the 
Big C on.